Welcome to the department seminar, where today's speaker is Brad Pierce. I was wondering if he was going to be in the There's a lot of excitement about Brad <laughs> um, Brad grew up in Wisconsin, in Hudson, Wisconsin, on the St. Croix River. Um, and there was a, a woman named Kathy who grew up across the river in Stillwater and met Felipe in the thin area. It's a fairly romantic story. St. Croix River. You grew up as a beaver, is that correct? You tried to teach me this song about a beaver, oh, which yeah. I can't remember because you have a better mind. But I don't remember it, but. I'm a beaver, you're a beaver, we are that's a beaver it. call. That's and when it. we get together, we do the beaver call. See, it proves. <laughs> <laughs> um, then he got a job on a Mississippi gambling boat as an apple wheeler. St. Croix. St. Croix, okay. Um, where I know he's very good at gymnastics and all manner of things like mountain bicycling, and so I presume he did flips and back dives for trips. Okay, then he got his BS degree in physics and math at UW River Falls in 1982. He got his PhD here at UW Madison in 1988, and that's when I met him. Uh, he was doing a postdoc with Don Johnson. One of the first things that he showed me on his computer screen was, hey, have you ever seen a Lorenz butterfly? Uh, it's, it was just a side project. The guy's amazing with uh, programming, computing, dynamics. He has several papers on dynamics. That makes them, uh, Global chemistry, unsurpassed. Anyway, um, he also got me into urban guerrilla mountain bike riding, which he can go down the stairs. If you go out the building, you can take a ride to the south. He can go down those on bike. I will never. Not anymore. <laughs> there were some places on the east side you found where the, the steep downhills with bolt, embedded boulders that I had biked down on and just took it as far as it was awesome. All right. Uh, NASA Langley, he worked there from 1989 to 2004. So in order to see Brad, I'd have to go to NASA Langley to, for a contract that I had. Uh, my first time kayaking was on the James River. It must have been 25 knots in our east, way out to a full time or something. Was cool. All right, um, he got me into flag campaigns. And I remember in 1997 going to the Polaris campaign in Alaska. And we took a side trip um, to Prudhoe Bay. We, we got as far as the pass. We didn't go down to Prudhoe Bay, but it was a pretty good adventure. Marcus Bucher had my camcorder, and he was, well, he went swimming in the Yukon River. Um, but I, so I looked up the footage on that, and I thought, ah, oh, it would take too long to show. But there's other interesting things, such as we drove through a creek after we got past Wiseman to camp, and uh, Marcus left the radio on, so, <laughs> so the car didn't work. And so we were going to, we took our boots off, went across the, the river, and we were going to hike 15 miles to, to get help. And within a, Five minutes, this orange truck came along. Um, there were people from Oregon laying fiber optic cable at Prudhoe Bay, it's like a once in a lifetime. So they just drove through the water, charged the car. Mm, um, from 2005 to 2018, he's a physical scientist in the advanced satellite products branch at known as this here at the Sims. And he blended Don Johnston's global hybrid model with uh, Great Triple E's UWMS and created the uh, regional Air Quality Modeling System, RACMS, and I urge you, if you have not yet, to go to racms-ops.sssc.sw.edu. The very best movies of carbon monoxide and ozone on clean trajectories today, for, for real time, it's quite an accomplishment. Right, Brad has been a part of every acronym that I've ever heard of, ARCCAP, MLS, OMAR, AOD, MODIS, GOZAR, CRTM, INTEX, NA, and more and more, now uh, LMOS. And he has recently been appointed uh, director of the Space Science and Engineering Center uh, for his hard work and integrity, and also, he's also very funny. He has over 100 papers in an H index of 28. Brad Pierce. Thanks, man. That's my problem. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, uh, thanks, Matt. Um, the story he doesn't tell you about the trip to Prudhoe Bay is we cross the Continental Divide. We have half a tank of gas. It's like I'm the pragmatist. I say we need to turn around. Matt's like, let's go forward. We'll find some gas at Prudhoe Bay. Luckily, we did turn around. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about today is the Lake Michigan Ozone Study. It's the 2017 Lake Michigan Ozone Study because there was actually an earlier one in in uh, the 1990s. Um, this one was much more extensive in terms of the suite of measurements that we had available. So the reason we care about ozone along the western shore of Lake Michigan is its impact on human health. So this is kind of a schematic 
uh, talking about the, how both fine particles, PM 2.5 and ground level ozone, can lead to some of the symptoms, shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, chest pain, and fatigue. And then for those that have uh, either cardiovascular heart disease or asthma, asthma uh, PM 2.5 can make those worse. For ozone, uh, ozone can make asthma and COPD and emphysema worse. So it is a, a legitimate health issue, and, and that's why the Environmental Protection Agency establishes these ambient air quality, air quality standards based on human health impact. Uh, these have been changed over the years. Right now it's at 70 parts per billion. It was established in 2015. So in terms of ozone pollution, ozone is not emitted. It's something that forms in the atmosphere. Uh, and it forms in the combination of sunlight and the precursor pollutants, in particular volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, and nitrogen dioxide, or NOx, and also carbon monoxide. So I'm going to be refer referring to VOCs and, and NOx quite a bit through this talk. So one of the reasons that I'm particularly interested in, in looking at ozone pollution is a number of these uh, species can be measured from sticks. When we built Rackham's, we built that as a, as a demonstration that we could use satellite uh, composition observations and aerosol observations to constrain air quality forecasts. And so the fact that we can observe, observe these from space uh, is what initially got me interested in this problem. So for VOCs, we're able to measure formaldehyde. Um, we're able to measure one of the components of NOx, which is NO2, uh, and we can measure carbon monoxide and, and ozone as well. So again, I kind of have to start with a little bit of background. Why do we care about VOCs? Why do we care about NOx in terms of ozone production? So I'm gonna walk through this a little bit. I just want you to keep it in mind as we start using the LMOS measurements to explore the, the relative magnitudes of these and how they impact ozone. So this is kind of a standard uh, isopleth of ozone. So these are isopleths of maximum ozone concentration, high values here, lower values here, versus initial VOC concentration and initial NOx concentration. So think about a a power plant or a car exhaust, it's emitting a certain amount of NOx and VOCs, how much ozone can you end up producing? And when you're thinking about regulating ozone pollution, you have two handles. You can control NOx emissions or VOC emissions. And depending on the environment, controlling one is more advantageous for the other. So let me kind of explain that. If we look at this part of the curve, when we're sitting at fairly low NOx values, maybe higher VOC values, this would be kind of typical of uh, downwind of an urban center or a suburban area, you can see that it's changes in NOx that control the amount of ozone that you're going to produce. So in this case, we would want to control NOx abundances in this region to control ozone. If we look over in this part of the curve, here we're at fairly low VOCs but much higher NOx values, so this is kind of typical of a polluted urban area. Then you can see that it's really controlling the VOC emissions or abundances that's going to control the eventual ozone production. So that's kind of the, that's the fundamental problem with trying to regulate uh, these precursor emissions to control ozone. And the air quality management community spends a lot of time in, in trying to understand what are the relative merits of, of reducing emissions of one or the other. Piece. And you can see it's very dependent on where you are relative to the source region. Lake Michigan is a very unique region because it is downwind from polluted urban areas like Chicago and has some of these urban and suburban characteristics. So um, if we look overall at trends in, uh, in, in, in nitrogen dioxide emissions over the last uh, 30 years or so, we can see this is from EPA trend analysis. You can see there's this downward trend uh, in NOx emissions. This is because of the Clean Air Act that was initiated in, in 70. Nine, and as a result of regulations that are uh, mandated by the EPA. You can also see this in satellite data. So this is uh, satellite tropospheric NO2 columns from the ozone monitoring instrument. Um, and this is what it looked like in the summer of 2005. You can see these are uh, column concentrations uh, of, of NO2, and you can see high values in all the major urban areas, particularly high value around Chicago, and if we look by summer of 2011, you can see from the same satellite 
there's been a significant reduction in these emissions. Again, this is reflecting the, the policy uh, implications of the Clean Air Act. It, kind of a, an example similar to what we've seen with the Antarctic ozone hole, where the Montreal Protocol leads to a change in the fundamental abundance in, in over the planet. I want to get a super track, but I'm curious, the policy results in these reductions, the implementation of policy, what were the, can you very briefly speak to what were the concerns about implementing it in terms of cost, and were they actually worn out? Or is it difficult to measure that cost because of human? I think the way, the way that, uh, the way that this is typically presented in terms of cost is that these, uh, these reductions were accomplished at the same time the GDP increased significantly. So whether these reductions cost additional resources, they do. But, and, and then now as we start looking at economic value, in addition to GDP, we want to look at what's its environmental cost. So the environmental cost should be part of the economic equation. So but human health aspect. Human health right. aspect. But I can certainly say that in spite of these dramatic reductions, and most of this, most of this is catalytic converters. So yes, companies had to invest <laughs> to put catalytic converters on their cars, but again, that's a that's a technological solution that required people are getting making money off of catalytic converters. The point is that we accomplished these reductions at the same time our GDP grew. Okay. Um, so there's the national perspective in Wisconsin. It's the same, the same hold true. So this is a, a bar graph showing the, the NOx emissions and the VOC emissions. Again, those two ozone precursors. Uh, in this case, they're broken up by their different source regions. So uh, highway vehicles, other combustion, industrial, et cetera. You can see that highway vehicles are a big part of that NOx uh, emission source. But you can see that that's re reduced from 2002 to 2014 pretty significantly. Same thing for VOC. So the take home message there is the air quality in the United States is definitely better than it was in the 1980s. And that's a success story. Um, unfortunately, there's still regions like the western shore of Lake Michigan that are, that are still in exceedance. But to give you an example, this is what ozone design values, which are uh, an EPA metric that's basically the uh, the top three third highest maximum ozone events on a given year. Um, and that's what's used to determine whether or not they're in violation. So these are oz maximum ozone concentrations. And you can see all along the western shore of Lake Michigan, and also the eastern shore, this is where the monitors are located. Very near the coast, you had uh, ozone um, design values that were above 90 parts per billion. 70 parts per billion is the current threshold. So all of these are actually in this 95 to 2000, 97 period, all of these are in violation of the current standard. If we go to 2005 to 2007, you can see pretty dramatic reductions in these design values, but you do see these spots uh, that still sit up. And the surprising thing, here we are up in Door County, uh, far away from any emission sources, and it's actually got the highest design value yeah. of anywhere along the shore. And you see these other points along the shore, uh, oh, uh, uh, Holland, Michigan, on this shore, that are still designed by. So this is the this is the perplexing problem that we're trying to address with the Lake Michigan ozone state. Are there significant emissions from shipping in the Lake Michigan? There are, and in fact, one of the things that we wanted to investigate was what's the relative contribution of emissions from ships. Uh, we are working with the Lake Michigan Air Directors Consortium, LADCO, another acronym, uh, and they actually monitor. They get real time monitoring of ship locations so they can incorporate those ship emissions into some of their uh, into their air quality modeling to, to, and include that in the emission sources. But, so yes, there are shipping. Uh, it's not as significant as on a number of other regions. Shipping, for example, international shipping coming into the port of Los Angeles is a, is a significant issue that they try and address. Same thing in, in, uh, uh, in Galveston Bay in that area. So uh, here we said that was to 2007. Here's where we sit in terms of 2014 to 2016, just prior to the Lake Michigan ozone study. And again, you see these sites now. This is a different scale. So now we're just looking. It's only these red ones that are above 76 parts per billion. Uh, but you can still see this is this is uh, just north of Zion, Illinois. That's a site right on the border between Illinois and, and uh, Wisconsin. There's Sheboygan, and then this is Holland, Michigan. But you still see these sites all the way up the coast to show these high ozone values. If you look inland, 
now we're 60 to 70 parts per billion and we don't have violations in that region. So it's really a very narrow coastal issue that we're trying to address. Uh, why is it so narrow and along the coast? There is a long history of trying to look at this. In fact, some of the first uh, impacts of lake breeze circulations on air quality were done for Lake Michigan. Um, so basically what you find is that you set up these lake breeze circulations, which I'll show you examples of uh, in the future. It's certainly something relevant for predicting uh, the weather in this region, particularly in the spring, but it's also relevant for air quality. This is a figure showing the number of exceedances uh, for a, a record from 2005 to 2014 um, that occur during each one of these 15-day periods. You can see that when we get into late May and early June, you have this rapid increase in the number of exceedances along the western shore of Lake Michigan. Um, and these actually are, it's this early June period that you have the largest exceedances. This is in concert with, this is uh, lake surface temperatures from uh, the NOAA Great Lakes Regional, uh, from Glirol. They have a high resolution lake surface temperature analysis. This is, act, this is also during the time when the lake is still cold and it's just starting to heat up. So this unique combination of uh, cold lake uh, beginning of enough sunlight so that you can produce ozone leads to this rapid increase in, in early May. And this is why we chose this time period for the field count. So what drives this uh, coastal ozone exceedances? And this gets into the, uh, to the, the role of the, the lake breeze circulation. So this is just a schematic. Um, this is the land breeze. So here's the lake, here's the land. Uh, during the day, the land is warm, and, and and so what you have is you have flow, sorry, during the night, the, the land is cooler than the lake, and you have this flow up here and rising up here, and this kind of return circulation. During the daytime, uh, the land heats up, the lake is still cold, and you get this onshore flow. So what happens in the nighttime and early morning is emissions from the land can get evicted out over the lake into a very shallow marine boundary layer. Uh, you can get all sorts of photochemical production out over the lake, and then it can return onshore to land. And the, the location of this convergence zone, this lake breeze convergence zone, really drives where you get convergence of emissions and ozone enhancements. And that's the canonical picture of why uh, we have these enhancements along the lake shore. The Lake Michigan Ozone Study was to go out and collect measurements to, to verify that, uh, and then use those measurements to improve our ability to model these kind of lake breeze circulations and their impact on ozone. And the reason that we need to do that is because the way that air quality management agencies decide on how to control emissions to control ozone, so we're getting back to that NOx and VOC mission, is they do future scenario modeling with air quality models. If the air quality models can't capture the sharp gradient in ozone along the shore of Lake Michigan, then they can't be used for state implementation planning to determine how to best regulate emissions to control those. So that's kind of the fundamental purpose of the Elma study was to collect those measurements so that we can understand uh, and improve the fidelity of our models that are used for regulatory purposes. So here's an example of the lake breeze that we captured during uh, LMOS. And this is pretty typical. This is from the Veers the, the Veers satellite. Um, and so you can see the, the fair weather cumulus clouds here, and you can see this uh, sharp delineation uh, where you have uh, no clouds. And this is the uh, onshore flow all the way around the lake um, that is showing this penetration of the lake breeze on this day. The resulting convergence zone here that leads to the, uh, the development of these fair weather cumulus, and oftentimes leads to development of uh, convective instability and, and severe weather. So uh, we had the, um, the Milwaukee, the, the Chicago office of the, Wisconsin, of, the, of the National Weather Service was providing forecasts for our flight planning. And they were interested in the lake breeze circulation in particular because of the likelihood that you might be firing up convection and needing to understand that uh, from, a, from an NWP perspective. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the various measurements that were done during uh, the Lake Michigan ozone study, the Spark trailer. Uh, which you've seen in the loading bay, uh, was deployed. Um, and on the, in, this, in this trailer, we had a, a number of remote sensing instruments. Its main purpose 
uh, it was deployed in Sheboygan, was to characterize that diurnal behavior of the lake breeze circulation throughout the campaign. Uh, we had a NOAA research vessel that we were we on loan from Glero that we used to do both in situ and some remote sensing. Um, we learned some difficult lessons with the trying to do measurements from this ship. I won't get into the details, uh, but um, including trying to fly kites off the back of that and having them with instruments on them and having them dive into the water. Uh, and then we had a, a two different aircraft, a NASA aircraft that was doing remote sensing and then uh, a commercial aircraft that, that we hired that actually the, uh, uh, the Electric Power Research Institute uh, funded to do in situ monitoring. And then we had a number of different ground-based assets. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is the set of measurements that we had available during the field campaign. Uh, the data is all now publicly available, and it's on the NASA uh, Langley archive if, if you want access to the measurements. So I'm going to focus in for a while on an ozone exceedance event that happened on June 2nd. Um, it was kind of one of our one of our classic cases. Uh, this is. The ozone monitors, you don't need to really read the numbers along the shore. What you can see is, again, high values along the shore up in the 81, 79, et cetera, lower values inland. This is a time series for uh, two different monitors at Sheboygan, so that's right here. Um, and then monitors at uh, Chihuahua and Kenosha Water Tower, which is right down here. And uh, this is the event we're, we're focusing on, this June 2nd event. You can see that we had a number, this is that 70 parts per million threshold that is in exceedance. You can see we had a number of other days with, with fairly high ozone. This one occurred at both of these sites, and I'll focus in a little bit more on that. So one of the tools that we used for doing flight planning uh, was high resolution trajectory uh, forecasts. So these are trajectory forecasts that are run with the uh, the three kilometer NAM nest, um, and we initialized trajectories at all the emission sources, so Chicago and Milwaukee, all the, all the, uh, the, the source regions for the emissions. They're colored by the time that they were emitted, uh, so you can see the afternoon and the early morning is up here in the yellow and red, and then we just look at their transport. And so what you can see is over the nighttime, we get emissions that are transported out over the lake, the lake breeze circulation starts building in and we end up infecting those up along the shore. And if you, in this case, is the vertical distribution of them, you can see that these, uh, these trajectories that are out over the lake are staying within a very shallow 500 millibar thick marine boundary layer um, and moving up into the Sheboygan area. This is a time series now of ozone concentration in parts per million versus time at uh, Sheboygan and Chihuahua. Again, you can see this ramp up in ozone. This is wind direction at Sheboygan and Chihuahua, and you can see at about 15 Z, at this very, very sharp transition. This is the onset of the, the lake breeze circulation as it moves on shore, and it's after that lake breeze circulation onset that you, you start building up ozone over the, the coast. <clears throat> so, as I said, we had the Spark trailer. Uh, at Sheboygan, and this allowed us then to look over the full 24-hour cycle at the thermodynamics, the winds, and also the aerosol composition uh, during these events. So this is the uh, this is a plot of temperature as a function of altitude. Uh, right now, we're going from midnight Central Time to, to 12 noon Central Time, uh, but this is GMT that's labeled here. Uh, and what you can and, and the winds from a wind Doppler lidar are right here. Uh, if we focus first just on temperature, this is the nighttime nocturnal boundary layer, cold stable boundary layer over land. Winds from the northwest uh, in this lowest kilometer. Here's sunrise. Actually, I think I'm showing this. So let, at, in the bottom we have uh, aerosol backscatter from the high spectral resolution lidar at Alaranta's lidar. Uh, Tim Wagner, who's in the audience, was the one that was deploying the spark during this period. But I kind of like to walk through. So here's the nighttime nocturnal boundary layer, sunrise at 12Z. Here we get the, the instability as sun rises and we start getting uh, warming and turbulent mixing uh, as the boundary layer increases. At this point is where we get this transition from the prevailing westerlies to easterlies associated with the penetration of lake breeze. And you can see that it's going up 
maybe to 400 meters or so. Um, and as you, and, and here's this cold, shallow marine boundary layer coming on shore associated with this lake breeze. And now we've got flow directly out of the south. And again, it's transporting those emissions from Chicago and Milwaukee up along the shore and impacting Sheboygan. At the same time, in, within this shallow marine boundary layer, we can see from the aerosol backscatter that we do actually have a polluted layer here. So there's higher aerosol uh, backscatter uh, in this shallow marine boundary layer than there was in the nighttime over land. So one of the things that we're doing during the field campaign, we're using the National Weather Service NAM CMAC forecast model. That's the operational air quality forecast model as part of our flight planning process. Uh, this model has been evaluated with some earlier measurements. This is from Patricia Cleary, who's at the University of Eau Claire. Uh, she, had, uh, she, she had a ferry and was doing in-situ measurements in the ferry going across the lake. And at this time period, which is in the um, 2008 to 2010, what was found was this is biases in the model. And you see that the model actually had a high bias in ozone <coughs> predictions both in the Chicago area and also uh, over the lake. So this is a bias of anywhere from 14 to 16 parts per billion. This is a pretty significant high bias. That was kind of the consensus based on this study and others, is that the models were showing much too much ozone production out over the lake. And that's kind of where we came into the field campaign, wondering uh, what we would see. That's not what we saw with the model in 2017. Um, in the same forecast model, it's still NAM CMAC, it's still run with essentially the same chemical mechanism, but they've updated their emission inventories since these earlier ones. And so they've changed their, uh, their NOx and VOC emissions, and you can see the dramatic impact that it has on, on the forecast. So this, again, is for June 2nd. This is the prediction from the model. Again, you can see enhancements out over the lake, but they're only about 60 to 80 parts per billion. Um, if we compare the, uh, the model forecast for throughout the field campaign at Sheboygan, these are the observations. This is a, a pollution rose. So uh, this is indicating the wind direction on this axis here. And this is indicating the frequency of seeing ozone concentrations of, above a certain amount. Um, and these are the thresholds for those. So these values that are yellow and red are ozone concentrations above 60 parts per billion and above 80 parts per billion. And you can see the observations when the winds are from the south southwest, we see the highest uh, frequency of these high ozone values. The model suggests that, but it significantly underestimates the frequency. In fact, it doesn't capture any over 80 parts per billion at Sheboygan. So now we're sitting in a situation where, in fact, we uh, underestimate ozone with the operational model. Yeah, I'm so curious for the emissions inventories that are used. How do they generate those, how often they get updated, and are they just from transportation or also does private sector provide? Yeah, typically so the emission inventories, they're updated by EPA uh, every, every five years. So a lot of people are still using 2011 emission inventories because the 2016 ones are not out yet. Uh, and they use for the power plants, they're actually monitoring the emissions at the stack level. So those are very accurate emissions. For the uh, mobile source, for automobiles, and for a number of the other different sectors that I showed earlier on, they have to use surrogate measurements to try and estimate that. So there's a very large uncertainty in those emission ratios. And those are typically kind of done from a, from a bottom-up approach where you collect as much information you can, use surrogates to spatially map it. What we're looking at now is trying to use satellite measurements to do more of a top-down constraint on those emission inventories. And I'll get, I'll touch on that a bit. Claire? So these observations were taken from Sheboygan and showed that the highest values are on the south and southwest. Yes. Wouldn't you expect them to be from the east with the lake breeze? So the lake breeze, if you remember, the lake breeze, when it's coming on shore, it is almost directly from the south. So the lake breeze, it, you know, the lake, it, it, it's not this onshore, offshore, it's a more, much more complex transport pattern. A lot of it is actually up the shore and then in training. And it's from the south, southwest because Sheboygan is on a slight peninsula. Well, that's right. 
Yeah, it is on a bit of a peninsula. So again, uh, significant underestimates in the observed ozone. So <clears throat> that's a background, what we see, what we saw with the operational models under prediction during this period. Uh, here's the, the, just the aircraft <coughs> measurements that we were able to make during this campaign. Uh, this is from the NASA Geotasso remote sensing flights. So this is a NASA B-200 that was basically doing raster patterns uh, to provide kind of a large scale distribution of the NO2 column amounts, just like I showed with the OMI satellite over the continental US, but at very high spatial resolution. Um, this uh, Geotasso instrument is an airborne simulator for the Temple satellite, which is going to be launched in 2020 and will provide us now with geostationary hourly measurements of NO2 and formaldehyde from space. So uh, what we're doing here is using Geotasso to collect information for a specific area. Um, again, a number of flights, a lot of these are over Chicago, a number of these raster patterns to try and look at uh, the, the, the transport associated with the lake breeze. In addition to that, <coughs> scientific aviation out of Boulder, Colorado, was flying a, a Mooney small aircraft uh, that was doing uh, spirals at predetermined waypoints that were tied very closely uh, with these geotasso measurements. And this gives us profile information that we can use to help see how the column measured from geotasso helps uh, understand the surface measurements and the profile of the rock. So here's an example from geotasso. Uh, again, this is column NO2 amounts. So the red are high values. Um, this is on a Sunday uh, at 8 to 10 a.m. on June 18th, and you can see very low values. The uh, scientific aviation aircraft was flying offshore. The winds were from the west in this case. And you can see the profile of NO2 is quite low during both of these legs. This is the next day, Monday at the same time. Period. You can see a significant increase in the amount of NO2. And you can see it from the retrieval, and you can also see a significant increase from the in situ profiles. And this is getting back to those different source regions. This is mobile sources. This is the commuter traffic coming in and out of Chicago. Sunday, very little commuter traffic. Monday, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to use these measurements now from an emissions perspective is these are high spatial resolution measurements. Can we identify individual source regions and understand how well the emission inventory is being characterized with those kind of measurements. Now, if we take those same set of measurements and we compare them with the, the National Weather Service operational forecast model, uh, what we find is that the forecast model significantly overestimates. It's the forecast model, column NO2 amount. This is geotasso measurements it's in a log plot, but you can see that uh, the, the NAM CMAC model systematically overestimates the measured column. There's a caveat here. I am not taking into account the, uh, the sensitivity of the geotasso retrieval to the, the NO2 profile. Um, and geotasso, these instruments are actually more sensitive to mid-tropospheric NO2 than surface, and this might move in some way, but we appear to have an overprediction. Um, that overprediction is confirmed with in situ measurements. So we can do the same thing now with all these aircraft measurements. I'm restricting this to only those profiles that were over water and within 400 meters of the surface, so it's the marine boundary layer. And what we find is that in terms of ozone predictions, we systematically underestimate the observations uh, in the model prediction in this marine boundary layer. And in terms of NO2, we systematically overestimate. <coughs> so again, getting back to that original ozone isoflet picture, it says that we have something wrong with our NO2 emissions, and it's adversely impacting our ozone prediction. So, one of the things that we did uh, is we tried to use the OMI satellite measurements to help constrain the emission inventories in the NAM CMAC, the National Weather Service forecast model. So this is an attempt to do a top-down constraint on the emission inventory based on the satellite measurements. This is what the tropospheric NO2 column looked like during June of 2011. Again, you can see high abundances over Chicago, uh, Milwaukee area and then a few point sources up here. Um, what we do is within a data assimilation framework, we use the analysis increment that we get from trying to assimilate these measurements into NAM CMAC. 
uh, normalize that by the uh, overall pile of abundance. And we use that to adjust the emission inventories, again, normalized by the local emission. And the key to that is getting this beta or Jacobian, which relates the sensitivity of uh, the, co the column abundance to changes in emissions. So here, this is kind of a poor man's adjoint approach to doing a top-down constraint on emissions inventory. We're able to do that. We're able to do this with just the normal 3D variational GSI. Uh, it's the NOAA operational system, and we do it offline after the fact to adjust the emission inventory. So, what do we get? We get that using the OMI data, we get a small, only about 4% reduction in NOx, NOx emissions over Chicago. That's a small, small amount. Uh, and we get a very small impact. So, here's a prediction on, again, June 1st. I'm uh, June 2nd, where we have this exceedance all along the lake. Here's the NAM, uh, the National Weather Service forecast. You can see that it's underestimating ozone concentrations <coughs> in the surface. By adjusting the Chicago emissions based on an OMI constraint, we do put um, additional ozone in kind of the right place where we have a deficit, but it's only about a part of a billion enhancement. So that's a very small enhancement. This is what's actually observed by the aircraft. Ozone concentrations out over the lake at this day were above 110 parts per billion, whereas NAM CMAC is predicting somewhere around 60 parts per billion. Um, so again, this says two things. It says, uh, well, it says it says something about where whether we're in a NOx or VOC sensitive regime, right? We adjusted NOx not by very much. We didn't get very much of a response. Part of the reason we didn't adjust the emissions very much is because. Our OMI has a very large spatial footprint, and we're really not resolving the structure uh, that is occurring in the emissions in Chicago. But it does suggest we're not in a NOx sensitive regime. So the second experiment that we've done with the, the National Weather Service model is we tried to look at what's the role of VOCs, and in particular, what are the role of biogenic VOCs. And remember, we're still in this springtime period, uh, and actually the leaf out is occurring over much of the Midwest. We can get this from leaf area index from MODIS. So this is the leaf area index, which again is just a, what's the fractional area that's covered by leaf at a given time. Uh, and you can see that there's leaf out south, uh, south of, of Chicago, but very little leaf out up in here on May 1st. By June 2nd, you've got this significant leaf out uh, that's occurred um, upwind from the region we're interested in and also leaf out along the lakeshore and then by July 4th we've got full leaf out. So the leaf area index actually as these plants and trees are uh, are leafing out is a period when they have a significant flux of, of VOCs uh, and so understanding the timing and the magnitude of this leaf out of the VOC emissions is critical. So uh, this is kind of a, just a schematic we get bio, biogenic VOCs which then can interact with uh, pollution within the Chicago plume and lead to ozone enhancements. So we did a second experiment um, where all we did is we doubled the biogenic VOCs in the forecast model. Um, in, at Sheboygan, the EPA, Jim Seifman, had a formaldehyde measurement. Uh, the black line, this is, this is during the field campaign, um, the black line are the measurements, the red line is the model prediction for the control experiment. When we double VOCs, you can see that now we're able to capture uh, the observations much better. So this doubling of VOCs is, is legitimate. Uh, well, if you see, we've also had an overall bias that was a low bias in the model, and we've reduced that bias statistically quite significantly. So the double VOC experiment, we had a much larger response. So this is the same uh, set of slides as I showed before, except now this is the double biogenic VOC experiment. And you can see that we've got much higher ozone out over the lake, above 80 parts per billion. And in fact, by doubling VOCs emissions, uh, we have made now 30 parts per billion of ozone. So we're in this environment over the, over the marine boundary layer of Lake Michigan that is very, very sensitive to VOCs. And in particular, it's very sensitive to these biogenic VOCs. So this kind of gives you an idea about the complexity of, of trying to not only just forecast this, but also simulate it so you can do regulatory modeling. 
Um, what we have is, we know we have this pollution plume coming up from Chicago and how it's interacting with the, the seasonal leaf out and production of biogenic VOCs is driving that ozone production out over the lake. Uh, and now we're getting values that are much closer to what was observed by the aircraft. <coughs> yeah? Can you go back one side? So what the aircraft is showing that those high values are really, really close to the lake surface. Yes. Right? How, like, about how? This is within, yeah, and there's, there's a lot of structure in here that we haven't really, it's within about 400 meters of the lake surface. So what's your feeling for the only instrument? How well is it resolving those, like, near surface? It's not, like, and okay. that, this gets into that sensitivity so the, the, these UV sensors are most sensitive to mid-tropospheric concentrations. They're going to underestimate the boundary layer amount. And there's ways to characterize that underestimation, but, but you're right. Okay. What, there's a new sensor up now called Tropomi. Uh, we had a presentation in here earlier from the PI of that instrument. Much higher space or resolution and is able to to resolve these features much better. But you're right, it's still going to underestimate it somewhat. Um, but what you can see here is that there's local enhancements that are quite significant. We're predicting a pretty broad enhancement with this one. So this is work that I've just gotten done uh, this week. Um, these are measurements, <laughs> so the figures are not quite as nice. These are measurements from that research vessel. Uh, so the research vessel started out from Holland, Michigan. It went over to Sheboygan and did a number of transects down the coast. One night it went back to Holland and then back again and made these kind of flight or these kind of cruises. So now this is a comparison between NAM CMAC uh, and the in situ ozone from these uh, ship measurements. I'm restricting myself to the daytime only, 12Z to 24Z. Um, and what you can see, this is the control experiment. We've got a bias of about six parts per billion, the model being low. Uh, in the VOC, uh, biogenic VOC doubling experiment, we've reduced that bias uh, statistically significantly. But you'll see that what we've done is we've gone from a place for, for the highest ozone observed out over the lake. The model was in fairly good agreement with the measurements. By doubling VOCs, now the model is over predicting these higher measurements over the lake. So again, it's having all these measurements together that allow us to hopefully try and tease out why the model has these different biases. Um, so to conclude, uh, we had we were able to capture a number of significant ozone events during the field campaign. Anyone who's ever been involved in the field campaign knows that if you uh, are out there to capture what you want to observe, you're lucky. Uh, we were lucky. Um, and what we find is that uh, both modeling and comparison with observations uh, is that this polluted layer out over the lake and its interaction with, uh, with, with background uh, uh, biogenic VOCs is, is critical to that ozone production. Uh, but that at this point, the mineralogical and photochemical model skill uh, needs improvement before we can really use these models to do accurate assessments of the importance of the different uh, emission scenarios for trying to regulate that. So this is basically summarizing that. NAM CMAC, the, the National Weather Service <coughs> Operational Model, underestimated peak ozone concentration and overestimated NOx concentrations during the exceedance events. And sensitivity studies show that this ozone production is, is very sensitive to uh, biogenic VOC emissions um, in the region. Uh, for those of you going to AGU mm -hmm. and sticking around till Friday afternoon, uh, there's a <laughs> session that will include uh, uh, the Lake Michigan ozone study, as well as a number of campaigns that were done in the Chesapeake Bay, Owlets campaign, and a campaign that was just done this summer uh, over the Long Island Sound. Uh, the Long Island Sound campaign uh, was, was looking at exactly the same <clears throat> kind of issues that we saw along Lake Michigan. In that case, it's New York City emissions impacting uh, Connecticut, but very, very similar circulation patterns and, and uh, perspectives. So uh, certainly go to that if you're around. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge, this is not my work. Uh, in entirety, it's got a number of contributions from a number of different uh, participants in the Lake Michigan Ozone Study. This study was sponsored by NASA, NOAA, EPA, and National Science Foundation, as well as EPRI. We had participants from a number of different universities in the area, uh, and, and it was a really exciting opportunity to bring uh, this, this 
this suite of experts into the field to try and address issues that the Lake Michigan Air Director is concerned in and the Wisconsin DNR is having uh, in this region. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, we've put out a, a final draft report that summarizes in much more detail about all the measurements that were collected. And these are all the participants in the field campaign uh, that were uh, that were actively involved in kind of trying to synthesize this. We actually had a number of other participants as well. So with that, I will close and take any questions. So is small improvement needed just a matter of spatial resolution or is there more to it? So, <clears throat> good question. We, following this campaign and using the measurements for, from this campaign, uh, Jason Otkin, and I are involved in a, a model um, development um, research proposal with the Wisconsin DNR and the Lake Michigan Air Directors Consortium. We're looking at both model physics parameterizations as well as model spatial resolution. So we've been, in the last year, we've been doing runs with WARP at uh, 12 kilometers over the continent of the US, four kilometers over kind of the LADCO state, and then 1.3 kilometers just over Lake Michigan. Michael, these are the ones I was telling you about. We run those for, and these are to define uh, the, the optimal modeling platform to do the, the state implementation plan model. What we're finding is that uh, some of the choices that are typically used by EPA in terms of their model configuration don't scale very well. They look fine at 12 kilometers. You go to higher resolution they start to actually degrade compared to the measurements. And we have some other parameterizations in WARP that appear to be better. Um, we're also working with the NASA sport team in trying to bring in additional observables like soil moisture. They have a soil moisture analysis that has been shown to be very critical for getting surface temperatures right, boundary layer depths right, and also a lot of the biogenic VOC emissions. <coughs> so that's on the MET side. On the chemistry side, again, there's large issues with understanding what the current emission inventory is. And so again, we're working with LADCO and some of these measurements where we will try and look in more, we, right now we're just doing this top-down constraint on the final emissions. What we really need to do to help inform the air quality management is understand what the biases are in particular sectors. Is it mobile sources that are wrong? Is it off-road diesel that's wrong, et cetera? And so we're trying to move in that direction. Plants. <coughs> no. um, do you have a sense of which biogenic VOCs and at least in the model something you want to the most reactive? Yeah, so isoprene, so that the the, mo the way that these air quality models are are, are modeling is, is isoprene, monoterpenes. Uh, and then their then their oxidation products, um, and yes, so there's a whole, you know, there's there's fairly detailed biogenic emission uh, modeling tools, Megan and Vice, right. that are used to try and understand these. Again, highly uncertain, highly constrained. Um, we we're doing experiments. Excuse me. Just curious of specific species, whether one more than the other. Yeah. And so Tim Bertram, well, Tim Bertram and then Dylan Millay were, I didn't, I talked about the Sheboygan site because we had this, the Spark trailer there. Uh, and it was focused on the meteorology. At Zion, we had a fully instrumented uh, chemical suite of measurements. And they're able to look at uh, various VOCs and start trying to understand uh, whether these are you know, you, are these anthropogenic VOCs that are coming from Chicago? Are these biogenic VOCs that are coming from Finland? And so there, that's a whole other part of this study that we're, we're trying to tease out right now. <coughs> the other thing we had, and, and the, uh, the tall tower measurements were, were something that we definitely folded into this study. We had in situ methane and, and CO2 measurements. And those were really, really interesting to look at the, the, the seasonal drawdown of CO2 and also signatures of you know, biogenic you know, background methane 
versus anthropogenic pollution. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot to look at with some of those methane CO2 tracers. Seem to be a really, really good indicator of some of the air mass history. And we haven't we haven't fleshed that out in detail. So study shows the importance of Point sources and close to surface can have really high variance in the amount of ozone. Yeah. So you think this geostationary satellite will do a better job in terms of uh, spatial resolution or vertically? It won't do better, res it won't have any additional vertical resolution. Okay. Um, it will have better spatial resolution. It'll be on the, and if I had some of the tropomy data, you'd see what 12 by 24 <coughs> pixel versus a 4 three by four pixels is dramatic in terms of what you can pick up. For formaldehyde, tropomy, and temple have much better signal to noise in that part of the spectrum. And so instead of having to aggregate a month worth of measurements to get a map of formaldehyde out, we'll be able to look at you know hourly measurements and get you know high quality formaldehyde retrievals out of it. So in that sense spectrally it's quite a bit better than only. But the amount of you're looking you're looking at uh, so reflected sunlight that's gone through the atmosphere twice, the piece of information is the power, and it won't, it won't be better than that. It, it sounds like VOC sources are roughly half pollution, half plants. Is that basically right? Or? Uh, VOC sources in this region are mostly biogenic. Oh, okay. So the How about universe, the, are agricultural fields treated similarly to natural vegetation in this regard, or about similar Fluxes per square meter per. No, the fluxes the, the mm -hmm. fluxes are very dependent on the you know on the on the tree species the plant species mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of that's what Ocker's point was you know a, a pine mm -hmm. forest is going to be emitting monoterpenes and you know a broadleaf forest is going to be emitting. Are there any interesting local chemistry issues with regard to snow melt or leaves being exposed after snow melt or? So snow melt is a. Is, a, is certainly an issue in terms of some of the nitrogen that could be released in that. Um, <coughs> I know, so so I think there it's, it wouldn't be a VOC necessarily. I know it's a, you know, the fertilizer that's put on the fields in the winter and the snow melt, when that's done, there's certainly a lot of, not just nitrogen that goes into the water system, but is also probably volatilized to goes into the air. I don't know about VOCs. <coughs> In that. Do, do people understand? I, I don't. I realize I don't understand the basic cause of the uh, the flow pattern that seems to be predominant. Is is that well understood? And perhaps more importantly for your study, do local detailed wind observations match with analyses yeah. for the structure of this flow? So for the lake region <coughs> in particular, yeah, that's a big part of the, the follow-on study that we're doing. Um, NAM CMAC is driven by NAM meteorology. It does a fairly good job of the timing of the onset of that lake breeze, even though it's a 12 kilometer model. Uh, it doesn't do, it overestimates. It's, it's got temperature biases and it's got wind biases. And we're kind of finding that, again, depending on, the, on what kind of choices you make in the physical parameterizations, you'll do a better or worse job as you start going to higher spatial resolution. So we're getting a lot of, we're using the, the area measurements and, to look in detail at how the model performs during these strong uh, lake freeze events and finding really big differences in you know, the timing and the depth of these lake freeze circulations. So. The, the direction is what if you're Coriolis? There's a Coriolis, <coughs> yeah. 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 It's, the, it's the direction, it gets the direction okay, but the timing of it, it doesn't get right. And an hour difference makes a huge difference in terms of ozone production. I was just wondering uh, whether there were particulate measurements made. In, in yes, there was. Part of this study. And I didn't, uh, so I did show the aerosol backscatter. Um, again, at the Zion site, there was, uh, we, we both, we took the AirNet sun photometer, that's, that's our sun photometer, and we deployed that down at Zion. And then we also did uh, both filter sampling to get speciation of the aerosols, and then also uh, continuous particle uh, <coughs> measurements to get the size distribution of all the aerosols. Uh, that's worked by the University of Iowa, Charlie Steiner's group. Uh, 
And so the results of that are sort of the size distribution work is, is fairly robust and that will be discussed at AGU. Some of the filter analysis of the speciation is still being done because that takes quite a while to do is there, it. Is there any biogenic contribution to the particulates? Yes, there's secondary organic aerosols that would be biogenic. Um, what we saw at Zion um, was there was there was some so the Zion I don't know if you've ever been to the the state park in Zion, Illinois. That's where the monitor is. There's a rail there's a clear railroad track that's just upwind of that site. And so one of the things that was seen fairly frequently was soot particulates from that commuter rail. Uh, we did also see aerosol enhancements uh, during these onshore flows, very much like we saw with the aerosol backscatter in Sheboygan. Again, the composition of that, we're still, we're still waiting for the, the, for the filter samples to be done so we can characterize that. From a size distribution perspective, uh, Charlie Steiner's done a lot of measurements over uh, various regions of the U.S. They were mostly much larger particles, very small nucleating particles, which sort of suggests that these are aged uh, polluted aerosols uh, associated with the transport up from Chicago, presumably, or recirculation out of the loop. So yeah, the, the aerosol is another, a whole other story, as is the, the, the high resolution and high, high uh, speciated composition measurements that were done in Zion that I'm not really touching on. But if that data is all available publicly now at the NASA Archive. Thank you all for attending.